morning. Um, thank you for coming out on a pre-Thanksgiving Saturday morning to join us. Today is the fourth portion in our series of sessions in conjunction with surveillance and privacy, art, law, and social practice. I'm Sylvia Wolf, director of the Henry Art Gallery, and it's a distinct pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, the occasion is a multi-day symposium focusing on the response of artists and cultural institutions to issues related to privacy and surveillance. It's a, it's a topic that, of course, is in the news every day. It's a topic that uh, is the subject of the artist's work, Juan Pumpin and James Coop. And it came out of um, a collaboration between the Henry Art Gallery and UW's Digital Arts and Experimental Media Program, AKA DX Arts. Uh, in addition to support from DX Arts and the Henry to sponsor this project, we have been generously supported by the Simpson Center for the Humanities, UW College of Arts and Sciences, by the Graduate School at the University, and by Tech Policy Lab. Uh, to date, we've had three speakers. Corey Doctorow, author and activist, gave a riveting and provocative talk about um, almost a month ago. And you can find it on DX Arts YouTube if you type in special lecture Corey Doctorow. Uh, two nights ago, Mark Rotenberg, president and executive director of Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington, DC, and professor of information privacy law at Georgetown U Law Center, also addressed uh, the university audience. I want to thank the Alumni Association, the School of Law, the Department of Communication, and the iSchool for sponsoring that event. And last night, Ed Shankin, visiting associate professor of digital and experimental media arts at the U, and a member of the media art history faculty at the Donau University in Krems, Austria, gave us a, a, a wonderful overview of artists who are working in surveillance, in uh, online, offline, plugged in, unplugged, um, drone et al. Uh, the whole domain of artists working in this, this fertile and, and relatively new er, uh, area, so I thought, until Ed really opened my eyes to artists who started way back in the 60s with these themes. Today, we are going to start a discussion of the project that is at the core of this symposium, Sanctum. That's the uh, facade window project that you saw as you came in. We have two speakers. The, the speakers that uh, are in your program are Juan Pampin and James Coop. Juan, uh, one of the co-developers of uh, Sanctum, unfortunately has come down with a virus, so he won't be with us today. But we do have James Coop. I won't read his bio because it's in your uh, black program. If you do not have one of these programs, just raise your hand. Does everyone have one of the black programs? OK. Uh, Emily, would you do me a favor? Thanks. Um, keep, be ready to put your hand up. Emily will come around with a black program. But we also have a, a special guest today. We have Mudit Kakar, an associate in the intellectual property group with the Dorsey and Whitney LLP, who focuses on patent infringement litigation. He's a graduate of the University of Washington Law School. He received his PhD from the University of Utah. He is also involved in drafting freedom to operate and patent invalidity in the in Thank you. In validity opinions for pharmaceutical clients. Dr. Kakar has presented his scientific research in various national and international scientific meetings, and he's published five articles in peer reviewed journals. He's also received multiple awards for his research. So, with that, I would like to invite both James and uh, Dr. Kakar to the table, and we'll just begin. Thank you. We thought it would be useful to just outline the genesis of the project. Can everyone hear? Okay, good. Just put your hand up at any moment if you have a problem hearing us. Uh, the Henry, just a little backdrop. The Henry Art Gallery has been around for 87 years. We were founded in 1926 by Horace and Susan Henry. He was a, an industrialist from the Midwest who came to Seattle. 
Uh, he was an avid enthusiast of the arts, and he believed, like many of us do, that arts ensure that a, uh, you have a tolerant and civil society, one that is sophisticated and visually literate. He and his wife owned uh, a collection of about 170 paintings or so in a big house up on Capitol Hill that's still there. And he would allow anybody to come in who just walked up and knocked on the door to see the collection until in 26, he gave $100,000, they gave $100,000 to the University of Washington, which believe it or not, was enough money back then to build our Beaux-Arts building that was designed by Carl Gould. Uh, the Seattle architect Carl Gould was also the founder of the University of Washington's architecture school. What, the reason why I'm giving you all this is because there's something that is unusual about this arrangement, and that is that Horace and Susan designated the Henry to be a museum of art of the time, of artists of the time. No contemporary art phrase or terminology back then, but the concept being that uh, a, a growing Seattle needed a venue where people could go and see what is happening in the visual arts world, what dialogue and debate are played out in the art of the artists. So 87 years later, fast forward, here we are. Uh, we have a history of commissioning artists to do new work for us. On a University of Washington campus, we're committed to research and artistic practice, or artistic practice as research. Uh, with that in mind, we still are aware that our 1997 Guathme edition is somewhat of a bunker. We quadrupled our space, we're cement from the outside. How many of you have had trouble finding the entrance to the Henry? I see a number of hands. It, we love Charles Guathme. He gave us a, a wonderful building, but it's got its problems. And one of them is a lack of visibility. So some years ago, when uh, we learned that the freshman dorms, four freshman dorms were going to be built and are now already up uh, across the street from us, we realized that we, if we're going to serve the university campus, people have to know we're here. So how do we get people, the thousands of students and the incoming freshmen, to even know where we are? One of our, uh, our, our tactics for addressing problems is to ask artists to help us address those problems. With that in mind, uh, and three benefactors, and I want to acknowledge UW um, Provost of Tech Transfer, Lyndon Rhodes, as well as Sarah Barton, and Rich Barton, he's the founder of Expedia and Zillow, she's a physician, gave us the funding to do an international call for proposals for, for a commission for a live, digital, and lively artwork for our Henry facade. The, the live and lively were the buzz phrases we, we had in the, in the backs of our mind. We had no idea what, uh, what we would find. 91 submissions from all over the country and all over the world came in. We had a jury, a selection committee that consisted of Henry curatorial staff, as well as uh, Christian Paul, who's the Whitney Museum's adjunct curator of new media and the director of media studies graduate program at the New School in New York. Daniel Friedman, dean at the time of the University of Washington's College of the Built Environment, uh, our board uh, chair at the time, Bill True, who uh, is an avid contemporary art collector, and our sponsors who are both uh, savvy, they weren't just sponsors, as I mentioned to you, they're savvy uh, members of the community and they were deeply engaged in the success of this project. In late spring 2011, the jury selected three finalists, Ed Perver, Natalie Gattegano, and Jason Kelly Johnson, a team, and James Coop and Juan Pampin, a team. Um, the candidates made final presentations to the jury. They were given a stipend to further develop their projects, and their final presentations were delivered in November of 2011, and we selected James Coop and Juan Pampin, hands down. It was the project that was the most provocative, which is what we were interested in, uh, that asked a lot of questions that we knew would generate dialogue and debate, and isn't that what a university uh, setting and atmosphere should be? Over a period of a year and a half, Coop and Pompeen created Sanctum, and today we're going to talk about uh, what that is. Uh, it went live in May of 2013, and it will be on view until and active until November of 2015. So there, in a, in a nutshell, is a snapshot of how Sanctum came about. 
now I'd like to ask what Sanctum is. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Sanctum is a piece of art that is concerned with public and private space and people and their, their relationship to it. Um, it's concerned with identity uh, and narrative and the relationship between the two things. Um, it's concerned with the, the difference between who you are in the real world and uh, how systems and algorithms generate uh, versions of yourself that exist virtually. Um, we could call that your, your data body, perhaps. Um, and it's a piece of work that looks to, I guess, follow some of the logic of surveillance and see where it takes us. So when you approach the um, vicinity of the gallery, you'll start hearing some voices. It's like a cacophony of voices. Um, and the idea is these would kind of make you aware that you know, there's something there a gallery, uh, a piece of work. And as you get closer, these voices should start getting more resolved as well, less cacophonous. You see the, the screens, there's 18 screens um, laid out on the facade. Uh, there's six cameras. And these, um, as you get closer, you can step underneath the overhang. And uh, once you do that, the cameras will start profiling you. Um, <clears throat> they profile people according to their age and gender, uh, looking at facial landmarks uh, on your face and figuring out um, or estimating your, your demographic by comparing it to a database of about 50,000 faces. So um, then it's kind of figured out what your demographic is. It goes onto Facebook. We have a Facebook application that's associated with a project which people can sign up for at sanctum.io. And um, it's gathering stories from Facebook. It's taking people's status updates and turning them into narratives. So when it finds your face, when you stood outside the museum, um, it'll also find some status posts by people of the same age and gender as yourself. It'll turn those into a story, and those will become the sounds you hear. It uses text to speech to convert those things into spoken words. Um, the spoken word should be in the voices of people who match your demographic or so. And on the screens, the images switch from, I guess, more generic surveillance footage of people walking around the area into uh, footage that includes yourself and other people of the same demographic as you. And you start seeing these stories appearing on the screen as subtitles, uh, telling a narrative which perhaps is a narrative that's familiar to you. I think the piece, as much as anything, is about um, narratives um, and how metadata, uh, by metadata I'm talking about things, um, you know, statistics, um, information about ourselves that uh, algorithms glean, um, and metadata is distinct from content. So if we think about um, a telephone call, metadata would be the time of the call, um, where it took place, who you were calling, and not the content of that call. And so what Sanctum does is take these kind of bits and pieces of information and use them to try and generate a narrative. In the same sort of way that, um, uh, you know, uh, being on Facebook or using Gmail is about generating narratives for you. You see all those little sidebars trying to sell you things because it thinks it understands who you are, it thinks it understands your narrative. Sanctum does the same kind of thing and uses that metadata in order to try and um, combine your visual profile with um, a narrative that is gleaned from Facebook. And you look at this and say, well, that could be me. It's not me. Um, and so what we're interested in really is, is where that narrative, the metadata narrative, uh, juxtaposes, um, seems familiar or seems completely alien. Uh, and that's kind of the logic of surveillance uh, that we're interested in in the project. So I guess that's what mm -hmm. Sanctum is. Can you talk about what hap um, the, 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 well, let, let me actually go to Dr. Kakar. Um, you are not hearing about this for the first time today. <laughs> right. But if you were hearing about this for the first time today, what are some of the things that would come to mind to you or questions you might have? Well, you know, the very first thing, and 
again, not going into the philosophical aspects of the project, but from a practical and a legal perspective, you'd be like, wait, so what about privacy issues of the people that you're recording or people that you're profiling? Because so I'll talk mostly in the context of Washington State, because so in Washington State, everybody has a right of publicity and right of privacy. So those are you know, some statutory laws or statutory rights that you have in addition to common law rights. I won't get into the details of that. So, you know, the right of, you know, think about right of publicity, which is the first one that would come to my mind because, you know, you're recording this, you're profiling these folks, and then you're using it for Henry or, you know, your, your, this art installation. But there's no issue with that here because, because it's a work of art. So, you know, everybody has a right at least, again, in Washington State, everybody has a right to their face, their signature, their voice, and their likeness, anything that can identify you. But if it's used in a context of a piece of fine art, educational purposes, or cultural purposes, then it's OK, as long as you don't make more than five copies of it. So it's very, it gets very you know, technical there, too. If you make, I mean, I know there are no more than one copy here, because it's just sort of a live project that's happening, but if you make more than five copies, then even in the context of publicity, then you kind of violate those laws. So that's not an issue. And we were like, okay, it's artistic expression, so that's clear. The biggest issue would be the privacy issue. And that's what we looked into before, I think even before the project took shape this way, because I mean, I know I do pharmaceuticals now, but the way I got involved with this is as a student at UW Law with the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic, James approached the clinic, and even before everything happened, he wanted to know sort of the question that you asked, that what would be the issues going forward in this project if we were to do this? And that's how we got involved back in 2009 is when I first met him and we had that meeting. So publicity was not an issue. Privacy what was the issue because Again, you know, without getting too technical, there are four, it's a statutory right in Washington as well, and there are two main ways that you can sort of violate somebody's privacy. And one of them, I won't talk about the ones that are not sort of applicable here or we were not really concerned about, but the ones that we were concerned about is what we called misappropriation of somebody else's likeness. So basically, if you're using somebody's face, voice, or anything that can identify them and use it to your advantage. And here, the statute says that use it to your commercial advantage, but the way the courts and the case law has interpreted that, that it can be non-commercial issues too. So the artistic expression is not exempted. It is from right of publicity, but not from privacy. So if you record something, or you know, in this context, even profile them and use for your advantage, and it's like I said, it's name, picture, signature, even signature can be a voice or likeness, without their consent, then you're violating that law. Mm -hmm. So consent which was the big piece that we were concerned about here, because the way initially uh, James described as the project and the way you did it in Europe was basically recording people without them knowing, absolutely not knowing, and then sort of matching the, the narrative to that. And I guess it's easier to do that in Europe because the laws are different. You know, it's, it's not as basically, because I think you gave me statistics. It, this, at least in UK, there's 10 cameras for every one person. There was, I, well, I think in, there was, in, in some cities. There was some crazy statistic that you gave me back then. I was like, wow, that's really crazy. I mean, that's, clearly not the issue here, or the situation here, because then people would be, gosh, up in arms. But, so that was the whole issue that, okay, how do we get over this consent? Because if you don't take consent from them, then you're clearly violating their privacy. So that was our biggest sort of area where we focused on it, how to avoid getting into that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll pick up on uh, how we address that situation in a moment. But I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that you were brought in in 2009, and we're now in 2015. Um, something pretty significant has happened since then. Can you talk a little bit, James, about 
pre and post June 2013 and, and uh, what that is and what that means? Yeah, I think um, obviously Sylvia's referring to the Snowden revelations and um, it's, it's, it's certainly really interesting that the Sanctum kind of spans um, the Snowden uh, leaks. Uh, it, it was commissioned and installed beforehand and now we're um, experiencing it uh, after that. So it's, it's been kind of interesting thinking about the project and how it's maybe its meaning or our experience of it has shifted in, in that time. Um, I guess, you know, pre-Snowden, um, I, I have made quite a few projects that use surveillance and you know, as Muda says, uh, we started working together in 2009 and that was kind of based on a, a very valid concern, I think, about um, what would happen if I started doing these projects in America. Uh, it's one thing to do them in the UK, um, but uh, in a much more litigious society, it seemed um, uh, sensible to bring in the lawyers. Um, so, uh, you know, what my, my general approach to, to working with surveillance was, was, you know, if you look at, look at the history of surveillance, uh, some of the things that Ed talked about last night, um, often you'll see that artists are taking a, a somewhat, um, I guess, uh, um, contested stance against surveillance and surveillance cameras, the presence of surveillance cameras. They're interested in finding ways to undermine them, to turn them off, to hack them, um, to redirect what they what they see, or to do performances in front of them, uh, to subvert them, and so on. But I, I feel like in this period, you know, say the late 2000s and and, and leading up to the Snowden uh, revelations, we may find ourselves in a, a kind of slightly different relationship to surveillance than we have had historically. Um, that's partly to do with the way that surveillance works nowadays. Uh, you know, when people think about surveillance, they'll typically think about cameras on the sides of buildings. But if we think about surveillance nowadays, it's much more prevalent um, on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. It's almost like a, a, a vocabulary or a language that we use to communicate with each other nowadays. We think about social media, uh, we think about YouTube, uh, Twitter, um, email even, as a form of surveillance or a form of self-surveillance. So, um, you know, as an example, uh, I went to the Occupy protests in New York um, uh, a few years ago, and what really struck me was, was, first of all, there was a lot of, I guess, traditional surveillance surrounding uh, Zuccotti Park there. There was, you know, the big NYPD cranes and so on with cameras pointed at everybody. So, you know, there we, we have I guess a conventional form of uh, surveillance, kind of Jeremy Bentham style, kind of panopticon kind of thing. But what was interesting was that as soon as any, any police officer did anything, like approached one of the protesters or um, as any kind of you know, scuffle that would break out, immediately they would be surrounded by 50 people with cell phone cameras, all going chuk, 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 taking pictures and you know each one of those pictures is going to social media. As soon as it hits social media, it's spreading to another few hundred people. And so we, we I was kind of thinking about surveillance as a sort of bi-directional thing. Um, you know, Mark Rottenberg talked about watching the watches. And um, so it seemed to me that this idea that we should, uh, that we can say surveillance is bad, you know, um, invisibility is good, seems somewhat at odds with the, the way we live our lives nowadays and um, also the way that we um, uh, draw benefit in some way, draw reward from being able to stay in touch with people and the way that maybe we have um, evolved into a situation where visibility is uh, an important kind of social tool for us and thinking particularly about, you know, what, what would it mean if you made a Facebook post that nobody liked or a tweet that nobody retweeted or a YouTube video that nobody watched? How would you feel about that? To some extent, we're associating uh, visibility and um, surveillance 
with meaningfulness. So it, you know, it felt to me like this isn't a black and white situation, our relationship with surveillance. So projects like Sanctum are looking to kind of put people in that ambiguous space. We've got this public space outside, but we're also constantly engaged in public spaces or supposedly public spaces like uh, social media. So when are we in a public space? When are we in a private space? There's that kind of layering of the two that, that's happening on a, on a daily basis, a blurring of the boundaries between when we're public, when we're private. And then, of course, when we are in public, with all the kind of conventional surveillance going on and tracking through cell phones and so on, um, we're all being turned into data at the same time anyway. So um, I, I guess pre-Snowden, very much kind of thinking about um, that ambiguity and Sanctum kind of emerged out of that. And then post-Snowden, you know, thinking about um, the, the, the revelation of the, or the verification for most people, I suppose, that we are being watched all the time indiscriminately, no matter whether we are suspected of a crime uh, or have done anything wrong, we're still having all of our data recorded by the NSA and so on. You know, this, this kind of um, narrative uh, structure, which I mentioned earlier with Sanctum, where it's generating stories from not who you are, but what you look like, what your profile is, that kind of thing, and matching that up with other people, um, maybe it becomes a little more menacing. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we noticed early on with Sanctum was the kinds of things people would do in front of those cameras. You know, they'd come up, they'd perform, they'd leave messages for other people, they'd take selfies and upload them to Facebook, so you have this kind of recursive, uh, you know, status post thing, relationship with Sanctum. Um, and so you kind of almost expect that post Snowden there would be a shift of some sort. I'm not sure there has been, though. No. And I think that maybe tells us something about that, you know, we're still waiting for the tipping point at which these kind of revelations will actually cause a, a genuine shift in our relationship with uh, surveillance and social media and so on. So it's still, I think Sanctum stands in as a piece of work that, that kind of explores that matrix of ideas. So let's, uh, let's return to the question of uh, how you choose to participate, uh, how, we, how we allow or invite people to participate. And one of the things that um, I value so highly at a Research One institution like the University of Washington is we have an attorney general's office, we have a risk management office, these are folks that uh, their job is to assist the researchers in the university to try and um, understand what risks they're taking. And in, not out of fear, but out of a desire to support that research as much as possible and, and in the, such a way that is promoting research but also maintaining uh, legal efficacy at the same time. So one of the things we learned, this question of consent, what does consent actually mean? And I'll pass this back to you, Dr. Kakar. Right, so, so you know, like I said, so when James came to us and described us the project, and we were worried that, oh, so you are recording people without telling them. And I guess, you know, because you're trained to think legally, that's what we're thinking at that time. But you know, as an artist, you probably, because it's so innocent. And let me, let me just say, he wasn't actually recording people without their consent. We're, right. He had a proposal. Right, but yeah, so what I'm thinking so. about is like the UK project. Yeah, not, not here, not in yeah. the US. That's you know? right. Yeah, it was like, no, you can't do that here. You know? But you know, as in, you know, if let's say you, know, you didn't come to us or you know, any other artists who don't have the resources to go to and you know, because you would think, oh, I'm not really exploiting anyone. It's sort of you know, like an innocent project, and it's art. Why should it be? But again, like I mentioned earlier, because the laws we do have, because you know, the, the US society is more individualistic, so you have what we call a property right in your own self. So a you know, right of privacy is one of those property rights that you have in yourself. So somebody else without, and you have every right to control 
how your identity is used. So if somebody else uses it without your permission for their advantage, and it could be a non-commercial use as well, then there's a problem because they are violating your right. And so when James came to us, we were like, oh, so it, if, it's, if we do this project in a private setting, like you know, when you're entering a museum or something, then there, it's easier to obtain consent from people because you can, you can uh, put it on a ticket or you know, while somebody's getting in, you can give them a flyer. As you enter the museum, you consent to being recorded for a purpose of an artistic project, which is surveillance art or whatever the installation would be. But in public place, how do you do that? Now, first of all, anybody actually has the right to record or photograph you in public. You can't really stop them. So you, because you basically, what we call is you don't have an expectation of privacy in a public place. So they, if somebody is recording you and from far or take your pictures, legally you can't really do much because you are in a public place and unless they record your conversation, because then laws come in that you can't record communication without consent of both parties. So, and the video recording also is a type of communication, and Washington is a state which it's called an all-party consent, that if you are recording someone, you need to have consent of, of course, your consent, because you are recording them, and the other party's consent. But then there are states where you can actually record people with only one consent, and one of them being New York. So it's actually, if you know, somebody were to do this project in New York, it, you would think it would be relatively easier, at least just from that perspective of consent, because New York is a one-party consent state, while Washington and a lot of other states are two-party consent states. So here, of course, you, know, you have James's consent, because he, he, you know, he's doing the project, but the person who you want to record you need to get their consent because it's not that just because they're in a public place, yes, you have the right to record, but what are you doing with that recording? You are doing it for purposes of artistic expression to your advantage. And so that's where the whole issue of consent came up, that how do we, how do we get consent from someone without actually sort of uh, breaking the integrity of the, of the project. So we brought the question back to the artist. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so we came up with a solution to um, use signage. And, um, you know, uh, you know as, as Muna says, we, we didn't really want to be in a situation where we had somebody with a clipboard kind of asking people to sign waivers uh, <laughs> in order to experience the work. And you know, I, I guess I guess the other thing is that um, in a project like Sanctum, we're really looking to get uh, almost as close to the boundary of what um, what the law allows, and uh, you know, th there's conceptual motivations for doing that. Uh, you know, these these pieces of work are uh, are not designed in order to you know have uh, to to endorse the NSA or the government or anything like that. But uh, I, I've always kind of felt that what artists need to be able to do is, is have the tools to take on these problems, um, which means they need to be able to replicate them in some way in order to make people aware of them. So when we think about something like surveillance, do we you know, paint a picture of that or make a video about it, or do we actually do it? And when we do it, we raise these issues in important ways. We put people into those positions and situations where we can generate, irritate those systems and ask questions about them. So it was you know, certainly important to um, push this consent issue um, into a place where the person experiencing it was asking themselves that question as well. Uh, I'm, I'm also thinking in the, uh, in the history of photography, Street photographers have wrestled with these issues in the past. Um, and the idea that when you're on the street, you have opted into a social and public space, and that a street photographer who 
takes your picture and then uses it to sell cigarettes in a cigarette ad would by all means be representing you in a false light. It would be a violation. Uh, whereas if, if a street photographer is expressing something about the human condition as you are moving through the city streets, that, that there's a much grayer area there. Um, but I'm interested, James, I'd, uh, I'd love it if you talk a little bit more about this idea of getting as close to pushing as far as you can. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, coming back to what I was saying earlier with um, surveillance not being a, a kind of black and white uh, thing, it's, it's, uh, it's a much more ambiguous relationship that we have with it. And I think you could maybe argue that, um, you know, we've, we've uh, become quite virtuosic at um, working with surveillance systems. Um, think about people who operate on a regular basis on social media or something like that. Um, to, to some degree, what they're trying to do is, is assert the sort of control, maybe, that, that Mudit's alluding to, of their own privacy. At some points, you are um, on display. You're posting something, um, which maybe we can associate with a kind of uh, exhibitionist kind of mode. At other times, you're uh, a voyeur. You're watching. You're absorbing. You're not contributing back. And you make the choice. You know, when do I want to be seen? When do I want to stay in the background? Um, and so, uh, you know, getting, getting close to um, those situations is important in order to, to, to kind of explore the new narratives, the new kind of um, things that emerge from being that way, from um, interacting with each other in that way. And so, when, you know, when I think about the narratives that we see in Sanctum, um, I, you know, I, I wonder, is, is there a generational um, uh, difference in how people experience them? and how people understand them. If you've never seen Facebook, do you understand them? Um, if you've never interacted with kind of non-linear, real-time uh, text feeds and things like that, does it make sense? It's certainly not a narrative in the same sense that you know, a, a traditional novel or book would, would present a narrative. It's one which is um, based upon information coming from lots of different sources and being compiled together. So you know, looking at, say, a Facebook uh, front page makes sense to us. We see feeds from all these different people, and they're all bound together uh, by us, because we're the, the common factor. Um, but if my you know, great-grandmother was to look at it, would it make any sense at all? Probably not. So getting close to these situations, putting, uh, making work that can, can um, not just represent these processes, but be these processes is important in order to explore the dynamic kind of quality of um, how we interact with media and other people today. So, um, no, I, th I think it's important to just go beyond representation. I, I like to think about these things as, these works as systems uh, rather than objects, uh, systems which have rules. And as you encounter these works, to a large extent what you're doing is trying to deconstruct those <coughs> rules. And people encountering Sanctum, I think, understand some of those rules because they follow same sort of processes that they engage with in, real, in the real world, in, in everyday life. Um, so they can understand that vocabulary and see where Sanctum is doing something different. And that's when the meaning of the piece comes through. So it's important to kind of be able to replicate and take it up to that kind of limit uh, as much as possible. I, I the the project benefited immensely from your proximity. We benefited immensely. Uh, we, we picked the best project out of the 91, just so happened it was in our backyard, uh, which was extraordinary because it was an invention, a creation, a work in progress with prototyping. There were things that had to be worked out. Can you talk a little bit about engaging your students, um, what that process was like? It was an 18-month research process. Yeah, um, it was a very complex project to, to make happen. Um, and I guess, I guess there are a few, a few reasons for that. Um, so uh, as you know, you know, we had this, this memo uh, that 
had been developed through the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. And um, when we kind of went into the uh, shortlist uh, selection panel meeting, uh, we had that memo, and that was huge, you know, um, to be able to... Actually, we haven't told them about this. So, okay. so the, the sequence of events was when the first proposal came through, uh, the 91 proposals, uh, it was at that time, was it, that you went to the law clinic and said... No, we, we went issues? in 2009, and then after receiving the commission, we went back and had an extra addendum to the memo, you know, specifically for okay. Sanctum. But you went to them before you were chosen as a finalist or after? We went back to them after, but okay. we went You the went before memo. and then you went back to them afterwards. Yeah. Okay. And, and I just, I vividly remember in that session of the jurying session, a lot of conversation about what this might mean, which of course, from the standpoint of a in, an arts organization that fosters, un, un, it, it's committed to uh, supporting uncertain outcome, it was interesting to us to have that conversation, and it, uh, we all had different attitudes and opinions about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but go on. Okay, so, so yeah, we, we, we went into this meeting, um, you know, well equipped, uh, I suppose, uh, and there was, some, there was some questions about the legality of, you know, making work that involved the kind of processes that Mood is describing. Um, uh, you know, questions about invasions of privacy, showing people in a false light. But the great thing about having this memo and maybe, you know, on a wider level, being part of the university and having access to resources like the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic was that as artists we could walk in um, with backup. Um, and, you know, I, I guess one of the things to say uh, about Sanctum is in many ways it's hard to imagine if this would have actually happened in a different kind of institution. Um, you know, those, the obstacles that would have been placed in front of artists if they didn't have this kind of uh, legal resource uh, may have been uh, insurmountable. So, um, you know, we, we went in, we had the, the legal backup, there was some question about, you know, whether, whether or not this would have been possible in some other larger kind of partner uh, museums. Um, questions about archiving video footage, recording people uh, live, that kind of thing. So we went, we went through, um, we, we were given the commission, and I think there was um, um, uh, a requirement that we would go back to the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic and get an addendum to the memo, which was a specific treatment for Sanctum. So the one that Moodit worked on was a kind of general purpose how to make surveillance art without getting sued uh, kind of uh, document. So um, we had this addendum done, and that, um, as far as we were concerned, and I think as far as the Henry was hoping as well, uh, that would be the end of it. We could go forward and complete the project. Um, and the reason it took a year and a half was because that wasn't really the case. Uh, the piece itself, I think, was maybe a six month uh, development, but we added a year onto that with um, um, a lot of the kind of uh, institutional and legal wrangling that um, uh, involved was involved around the piece. And there, in, in this I'm kind of very interested in the difference between the law and risk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something can be legal, but that doesn't mean you can do it. Um, it doesn't mean that the university or the gallery or whatever is willing to take on that risk. And again, this is another reason why I think the University of Washington was kind of uh, uniquely equipped to be able to realize this project and other galleries and museums of you know every different scale and size uh, may not have been able to do this. So we, uh, we produced this memo. Um, for Henry, I think we're, we're keen to proceed, but it had to be checked off by the Attorney General's office. Um, and they had some concerns um, about um, you know, the position that was being assumed in the memo um, about whether or not uh, it really, I'm not sure they entirely agreed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, it got pushed off to the Office of Risk Management, which the university has an office which decides how much risk um, the, the university is willing to take. And the university is a self-indemnifying institution. 
obviously, as Sylvia says, is a research one institution. Um, it's very accustomed to dealing with questions of risk. If you're a chemistry professor, uh, the university in many ways would require you to take risks. Um, how are you going to generate new, interesting, important research if you don't take a few risks? And we were, in some way, asking for equivalent treatment for artists, which is, you know, maybe unfortunately a, a rare occurrence. Um, we're asking, okay, we want to do something that's not a representation of risk. As I said, it's not, we're not painting a picture of surveillance. We're not, um, you know, uh, archiving some uh, performance of surveillance. This is actually surveillance that we're doing, but we're doing it as artists, and we're doing it in order to explore ideas. And so we want the backup of the university in order to take that risk, and we want the museum to be brave enough to support artists in that and not just say, okay, well, um, you know, we're a risk-taking institution, but when it comes to, like, risk, we don't mean real risk, we mean just, like, the representation of risk, right? Um, so, uh, you know, we, we went through this thing with the, the Office of Risk Management where they um, uh, put in a, a few different requirements for us, the main one of which was the, they had a desire for people to be able to opt out of the work. Um, so, uh, which we found interesting, because again, that's an example where the legal research is saying, uh, as long as you have consent, and we have these signs around the vicinity, people come in, they give their consent, then you can you know, show people in a false light, you can video them, and so on. But to be able to kind of opt out seemed like you know, um, a risk factor, uh, mitigating risk, rather than dealing with what the law was actually asking us to do. So um, at this point, we sort of find ourselves in this zone of uh, risk versus law and, and start trying to negotiate and navigate around that, trying to maintain the integrity of the project, trying to get as close to what the law will allow as possible, but still make the project happen. So the main thing they wanted was, was for people to be, opt be able to opt out. So what we did was um, define a zone, which is the overhang of the, of the museum, as a place where people will be profiled. When they're outside of that, they won't be profiled. Um, and so that's what we came up with. And you know, to be honest, we were going to do that anyway, because the, the resolution of the cameras doesn't give us enough pixels in a face to really be able to uh, profile people much beyond that. So you we didn't tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> so we were OK with that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of uh, how things progressed, I suppose. How? Um, uh, May I call you Mooted? Yeah, okay. so Mooted. Um, Mooted, you taught a seminar on around this subject. Uh, you, wh why is it important an important issue for lawyers and students to have a conversation about these issues? Right. So we did. You know, it was interesting. We did organize a seminar around this topic. Uh, it was even before the memo was done, and we were still in talks with James. It was there's the sort of a national organization, it's called a data privacy organization, you can uh, Google them. So they organized what's called Data Privacy Day and they contacted you know, law schools around the country and they were like, hey, we would really like if you do some sort of event sort of commemorating Data Privacy Day. And, so, and we were in talks with James and we were like, wow, this is a perfect opportunity to bring this together, you know, because there is that invasion of privacy in, you know, in the project, if you, if you would, simplistically speaking, not anymore, but there is that invasion of privacy, so it would be good to you know, profile an artist, and so, but also bring sort of like a civil liberties perspective too. So we, we had James featured as an artist. We had a US attorney sort of giving us more uh, in-depth legal perspective and more federal perspective. And then we also had a representative from ACLU, their technology and liberty director. So sort of combining everyone. And it's surprisingly enough, because at law school, we have like at least one or two events every day, you know, the multiple. And that event, like all three years that I was there, was the most heavily attended event. So there was like a room probably twice the size of this. And then there were students standing elsewhere, because 
I guess everybody, all the students were interested in that whole user privacy. I guess it comes down to what you were talking earlier about what we do on Facebook and now Instagram and whatnot, because I know you mentioned, and I get upset when nobody likes my Facebook post or photo. I'm like, what? Why did I put it? And I, sometimes I take it down when like, nobody likes it. So, so you know, as students and you know, as, I don't know, relatively younger people, so we do project and you know, so much data outside in the world, but at the same time, we don't want to be exploited. Because, you know, and that's why if you notice, Facebook keeps changing its privacy guidelines and now you have option if you want to post a picture or whatever to just your friends, a group of friends, to public. So sort of trying to give you more control over what you want to do. And that's why, and the way we advertised the, the project, uh, the seminar was, uh, we called it uh, surveillance art, you are being watched. And it was more like that if you think that you can't be video recorded in a public place, you're in for a shock because, like I said, the law say you actually can be recorded. You know, there's no expectation of privacy. So there was a huge interest from uh, law students in this area from various perspectives because there are students. Uh, oh, that's because we also did this event, uh, not just technology law society, we also did it with advocates for the arts. That's a local group at law school and also the UW Law chapter of ACLU because all these you know, very different you know, group of people are interested in this area. Advocates for the arts are interested because you know, they want to sort of push the boundaries and, you know, uh, of art. And ACLU folks were interested because, you know, oh, wait a minute, you're sort of invading on my privacy. And you know, what do I have to say for this? Or what do you have to say to me about this? And then, of course, there were we, you know, the technology law folks because there is you know, all sorts of technology involved in you know, bringing a project like this together. So yeah, so it was a very, very heavily attended event by law students, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, another thing to add, I, I think, on that, on that note is, um, you know, so as, as I said, the risk management were, were concerned with people opting out. And it was interesting, there was, there was two different um, consent signs that were produced for the, for the outside of the building. First one of which was like kind of scary looking and was about how, almost like how to avoid the project. Um, which, uh, you know, we thought was interesting that, that you know, the, the concern was always about people not being watched, whereas in fact, um, my experience of these kinds of works, uh, I can think of one I saw in Liverpool, it was like a big, giant big screen in the middle of the city and there was this big finger that would uh, point at a certain person who was stood in front of it. And people were like lining up, they were like, you know, pick me, pick me, mm -hmm. right? So there's this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, assumption that people would avoid uh, that kind of thing. Whereas in fact, what was more important, it seemed, was to find ways to help people opt in um, to, to have that choice. And, um, you know, echoing, I guess, what, what Mood is saying, that people are very interested, interested in privacy because it's such a, you know, gray area in many ways in terms of what our relationship is to it. We want to control it. We want to have choice about it. But that doesn't always mean that we want to be invisible. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what came out. The other thing that came out with the, with the seminar was that these privacy laws seemed very sort of antiquated. Mm -hmm. They seemed very much out of step with, um, you know, our relationship and expectations of privacy nowadays. They weren't taking account of things like the internet and yeah. so on. And um, you know, that that seemed important. Um, I remember talking to the uh, assistant attorney general who was there at the time, and he was he, he was he was he was he seemed to be looking for a test case of some sort. He seemed to be like saying, you know, you should really push this get sued, and then we'll change the law, right? I was like, I don't know about that. Um, you know, we need, some, we need some indemnification at least. Um, and you know, the indemnification thing is really important. I think one of the, one of the big motivations for this symposium is to, to help other artists and um, museums uh, realize similar kinds of projects and get past the obstacles I was referring to earlier. The fact that the University of Washington could pull this off means that, you know, we, we, I think we have a responsibility to share the process that we went through. Um, you know, one of the um, uh, other larger museums who we consulted on this 
uh, their lawyers was, uh, they, you know, their response was that they would expect the artists to take on the liability that might be associated with, um, you know, making work like this. And if the work had to be taken down for some reason, they would expect a refund from the artist, you know. And so I think in, in those kinds of situations, um, what artists are really looking for is support from the uh, museum, from the gallery, to kind of back them up and not push the liability back to them, to be able to say, okay, this is, you know, we're in this together. And so, you know, contractually, that was something that was very important to us. You know, we went through a few different drafts of the contract, and it was only after risk management signed off on it that we as artists weren't indemnifying the project, and we were very concerned to make sure that wasn't the case. So, you know, I think you can only do these, take these kind of risks as an artist if you're being backed up by the institution um, and that risk is, is, is being kind of taken off the hands of the artist so that they can really explore these ideas and that's important. So I just want to like kind of, it just reminded me of something. You mentioned the AG's office and that's when James came to us. I think our simple answer was, yeah, go ahead with it and get sued. You become really famous. You know, so that was sort of, one way of our, you know, like pushing the boundaries of go get sued and, you know, that would bring something. Or if you have a lot of money, go to lobbyists and try to get the laws changed because the way the laws are so antiquated. But then, you know, those are not very practical routes, I guess. Um, yes, I think, I think what we're going to do now, uh, we figured we would talk for about an hour. We have another hour because this, we want pe people to ask questions and be able to answer them. And things will come out from that that, uh, that might be unexpected. So, yes, please. Hang, hang on just one second. We are recording this so that the others who were not able to be here could, I think there's a question over there, Julie, um, so that others will be able to see this. It'll be up online, but we do ask you to ask your question with a microphone so we can hear it. So, julie has got one right there for you. I'm kind of curious, how or do the legalities change depending on the supporting institution. I mean, you see this mounted on the outside of, of an art gallery and say, oh, it's artsy fartsy art gallery <laughs> with some interesting ideas. How would or would it change if this were mounted on the outside of the courthouse downtown? Uh, it won't. It's, it's the same law. You know, if it's outside the court or a courthouse or if it's, you know, outside you know, the art gallery or the library or whatever, because again, you can record somebody in a pr public place, but what you do with that recording, if it's to your advantage, you need a consent wherever it may be. And, but it's easier to get that consent in a private setting. And also there's one thing, you know, I kind of forgot to mention that I was talking about Washington be a two party consent state, but and you know, we don't go about you know, asking for waivers from folks that, oh, do you consent to being recorded? And the court, you know, the appellate court in Washington uh, State has said that as long as you're aware that you're being recorded, you've consented to it. So you, you kind of have to be you know, like proactive by saying, no, I don't want to be recorded or something. So as long as you know that it's recorded, that's an implied consent. And that's what we ended up doing in this project. But, Short answer to your question, no, the laws remain the same wherever the installation may be. Yeah. I, I think uh, also, you know, it's interesting to think about the site, you know, the way, the way you're describing the art gallery, it's almost like to say, well, you know, it's okay there because it's just, it's just art, right? Um, it's not that important or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, art really is important because it can introduce these ideas. And I think it would be great to have sanctum on the front of a courthouse and in many ways maybe it would be able to um, you know tap into the ideas that it explores even further by asking people questions about what it means to be in that place and the level of uh, surveillance and data collection that's going on when we involve ourselves in those kind of legal processes that happen inside a building like that. So you just said as long as you know you're being recorded, you give your consent. I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, so post Snowden, you know, we all know now that we're being recorded all the time, but we don't consent. So what's the line there? Well, so, see, that's, uh, 
it's like you can say we all know that we're being, being recorded, but we don't know for sure because the government would say that no, you're not being recorded. So there's that that proof, you know, like let's say if you were to go, you know, to it's kind of like that because it's like you wait, wait what do you mean you're being recorded no you are not being recorded so it's like if it's just your perception that you're being recorded no you know there's there's no proof that you're being recorded so that's a you you have to kind of yes we all know but it's like how do we know okay the Snowden thing happened but then okay what's our proof let's say if we were to go to a court what would we take and show that wait a minute you recorded me on these 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 times so the laws are still the same, you know, and the nothing has changed, so to speak. It's like, no, you are, I guess their simple answer would be, no, you're not being recorded. Yeah. Even though you could say, we know. The, because, you know, the, like I said, you know, and you mentioned the law, laws are so arcane because when it says, if you know that you're being recorded in such a context of, oh, like there's a camera there, or, you know, when I'm walking, I see a camera, okay, got it, you know. That, but now with this whole NSA and whatnot, it's become so sophisticated because even in Washington State, there's statutory laws that without your consent, nobody can record your telephone conversations. Like that's still on paper. I checked it last night again. You know, it's there with no changes to it. And it says the only exception that it talks about, it uh, talks about that if there's like an you know, before you talk, it says, oh, this call is being recorded, or if there's like a note that tells you, or if it's like an emergency situation or threats of like 911 call and stuff. So, you know, that statute is still very much there without any changes. Now, I'm not well versed in Patriot Act, because that may have changed some of those statutory laws. And then when it comes to state versus federal, federal laws preempt state laws. So, Again, like I said, I don't know much about Patriot Act, but there might be some provision in there that would say, no, you can be recorded if it's for national security. That's such a broad umbrella that you know, somebody would give you. But if you look in the Washington uh, statutes, it's, it's still very much there. Yeah, I guess um, what's interesting to hear about that is that on some level, there is no legal kind of recourse against that situation which I think pushes the responsibility even further towards artists, actually. Um, when I talk about kind of getting close to the law, getting close to what's, what, you know, what's possible, and also um, needing support from these kinds of institutions so you can take advantage of um, you know, the various um, liberties that we might associate with artists. They can do these things in the name of creative expression or self-expression or whatever. Um, so, you know, for instance, um, thinking about the way art maybe changes in response to, to, you know, this awareness that we're being constantly watched. It's about maybe artists taking on, um, you know, different sorts of uh, roles, different, using different kinds of technologies, um, being involved with metadata, maybe being more concerned with metadata than content in the way that they make their work, developing skills like being able to program, being able to hack things, that kind of thing, which seems to be an interesting direction that artists are moving in in order to respond to these, these kinds of problems. And again, that's something very uh, important, I think. You had a question? Uh, similar question, or a question along similar lines. Um, I, I was really interested in what you're talking about with bringing it right to that boundary and um, people um, being often more interested in opting in. And, and, and from my perspective, after experiencing the piece, I almost want that too. I almost want, I almost want to see interesting metadata extracted about me and put up there weird context that's maybe not appropriate and, and, and to see that juxtaposition. But I realize my perspective is on those people's. But so, it, from that perspective, how how now post Snowden and um, and post doing this piece with all the process of this entailed, how how would you maybe do it different? And I know that's kind of a you want to do it different, but because of legality. But uh, moving forward, I mean, um, going somewhere where the laws are different, or um, what's next, maybe? Um, well, yeah, I mean. 
this this is an unusual an unusual project um, for me and for Juan as well, and that it's a public artwork, you know. And I, I don't think there are too many. Um, there may not be any at all uh, examples of public artworks that use social media, for instance, in this kind of uh, fashion. The use of surveillance. You know, it's a pretty unique project. Um, when we encounter public art, usually we don't expect it to actually involve the public, you know, in this kind of way. Um, so, and it, you know, it's also very complex. As, as Sylvia says, it's been running for 18 months, and it's just done so with almost no downtime at all, 24 seven, which is quite an accomplishment too. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot we can be proud of with, with Sanctum. In terms of, of changing things, um, you know, I, I think, I think armed with this knowledge that we have about how we managed to test the institution and explore legal issues, um, you know, we could think about pushing that further. Um, uh, you know, it would be interesting to imagine alternative uh, ways of formulating the algorithm, improving some of the technologies. Post Snowden, maybe making it um, trying to get closer to some of those processes that he unraveled. Um, you know, I guess I, another thing that, that's kind of interesting about this project, I suppose, is that it is on a university campus, and there are many other things that could happen with this footage. Um, it won't happen because of the limitations that are, have been imposed by the university and risk management and so on. But you know, I, I've been approached by um, anthropologists who want to study uh, the gait, the way people walk, and associate that with their demographics so we can figure out do people of different ages and gender walk in different ways. And so as a, a kind of corpus of data, of information, um, it's, it's incredibly valuable and extremely unusual. You know, where do you get that kind of data from? Uh, the statistics I have somewhere tell us that 24,000 people have been profiled by Sanctum so far, um, which means they've stood in front of it and interacted and participated. Um, there's 40,000 stories that have been generated by the system based on people's Facebook data. Uh, 60% male, 40% female. So there's a massive amount of knowledge of metadata in that system, which could be used for other things. And um, you know, I wonder if this had been a science project, if it would have had the limitations um, that have been imposed on Sanctum. You know, when an anthropologist approaches, we have to say no. You know, we're not allowed to use the data for anything other than artistic purposes. That's that's what people have given their consent for. But um, you know, in a, in a later phase, maybe we'd redesign that consent issue, broaden it, and make it closer to maybe some of these kind of NSA style um, workarounds, which they seem to come up with. You know. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the back here, and then over there. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you modeling the importance of doing cross-discipline work. I think is kind of critical in these responses. Um, I want to foreground my question with the recognition of our proximity to the Northwest Detention Center. And I'm wondering, for the people who have the least amount of privacy in the physical boundary of this country, um, their citizenship status is contested. So how can we expand this conversation outside of the law. Does that make sense? I've already got one. <laughs> so it seems like this conversation is grounded in the law, right. what our legal right to privacy is. And for me, I'm wondering about the people who seem to have the least privacy, who have no sovereignty. So how do we expand our conversation? Was that more clear? It is, but I, I don't know, you know how much I can, at least from a legal perspective, because again, not knowing, because I guess in the context of, again, 
again, completely not knowing anything about that area of law, like in, in, I don't know, in context of detention center, if you're talking about then, I guess there are other statutes and actually on paper that, you know, that when you enter that, your, that institution, then your right of privacy actually goes down a lot. You know, that there is that, uh, and, it's, and, and that's on the paper, you know, that's, that's what the law is. But then there have been cases where, gosh, I, was, I think I was reading something recently where, where you know, based on some sort of, uh, when they're like very intrusive searches, you know, wh when you're in a prison system and stuff, that that is sort of violating my right to privacy. And so there, there have been cases to that regard as well. But I, I don't know much in, in that context. Um, I, I, I think maybe the way that we'd expand that conversation is to think about you know, systems and models um, and the relationship that this specific project has with the relevant laws and institutions that um, you know, frame it as maybe a model or a, or a, a way of strategizing uh, ways of taking these ideas into different contexts. I mean, obviously, Sanctum is not um, equipped to uh, reference those kind of things. It's not conceived that way. But for instance, um, one thing that has come out of Sanctum and um, our relationship with the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic has been a, a class that we're teaching right now, along with uh, Professor Sean O'Connor, who's right here and is on the panel this afternoon. And um, it's an uh, art, law, and social practice class. And it's two faculty from DX Arts, two faculty from the law school. And there's um, a handful of law students, a handful of DX Arts PhD students. And what the, what the class is really about is investigating gray areas in the law, um, maybe such as what you're referring to, and also um, exposing artists to those. So that rather than just, you know, um, paying lip service to those kind of ideas, you know, talking about them or, um, you know, acknowledging them, they are maybe putting themselves in a position to do something about them. Because I think one of the biggest impediments to artists working in these kind of gray areas successfully is they don't have the right information. If I didn't have this memo, it would have been really hard for me to conceive of a project that could really explore and navigate around these privacy issues in a constructive, generative way. I could have just done something extremely kind of controversial, like Moody mm -hmm. says, get myself sued and then you know, become famous or whatever, but that doesn't do anything. It just makes a kind of stupid art project uh, that's controversial just for its own sake. Um, it's much more interesting to be able to understand these, these gray areas and then intervene in them, do something within those areas. And that's really what we're, we're trying to uh, educate, uh, you know, a generation of lawyers and artists who share that knowledge and share those resources, work together on projects. The projects they've come up with are very wide ranging. Uh, they involve things like privacy. And um, so I think, I think we've got to think about like the legacy of doing something like this. Um, and what it might be able to contribute towards the kind of things you're talking about. And again, that's one of the reasons we have this symposium and we're documenting everything. We'll have a digital publication, which we hope rather than just being a record of what happened, becomes a resource for other people to draw upon and be inspired by and um, help them realize a similar project. Thank you. Um, Janine, when you're done there, since you're there, the lady down here has been waiting to, but go ahead since you're right there. We'll get, we'll get. <laughs> so I find it uh, really interesting what you just talked about, you know, how far you push the limits, how far the artists push the limits of uh, uh, what's possible within the legal framework and the risk management framework. I mean, this is, it's interesting to take this idea of surveillance and actually try to uh, implement it in a, uh, in a institutionally possible way. Um, so that's something that's unique about this project. Uh, but what I find interesting is just now you're talking about, well, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we don't know what else this data could have been used for because we've been approached by these other organizations. And if, we, if, if 
if the uh, original memo had been a bit more wide ranging and we could do something else with it. And I find that that sounds a lot like what the you know security infrastructure would be would be saying, right? They're like, well, if you just let us collect the data, then we'll come up with interesting things to do with it. We'll mm -hmm. protect you if you just let us keep it. Just give it to us and we'll do something. Mm -hmm. And so I find that's that's an interesting place that you end up with once you start accumulating data is mm -hmm. you don't really know what you can do with it until you you have it yep. and you can look at it. So that's interesting. Um, uh, one question you, you mentioned very uh, way back in the beginning, James, about this. You've got sort of a physical self uh, and then a, a, a data self or a data body. Uh, and so the question is here is that, you know, coming from a background in information security where we look at lots of uh, ways to identify individuals based on supposedly anonymized data, uh, to what extent does, uh, does case law or does uh, the, the statutes define this data body and protect individuals? Well, so in the end, you know, like I said, you know, there's, again, in context of public place, you can collect what you want, but what you do with it is an issue. And just sort of give an example of, you know, online data collection. Basically, every website that you visit, tons of data is collected, because sometimes I'm, and well, now that I know more of it, but back in the day, and I was like, wait a minute, this is kind of freaky. How does this website know? that I was looking at this jacket on a different website, you know, like something completely unrelated. And you're like, well, I never really gave my permission to anyone to do that, to even collect that data. But you actually did, because if you scroll down at the bottom of every website where it says terms of privacy, you click on it and you read it, it says by accessing this website, you consent to us collecting your data for these, 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 these purposes. So, that's how you sort of get around this whole implied consent, because basically, I mean, one can make an argument, you know, here, like James is restricted by institutional sort of restrictions saying, no, you can't use it for anything but artistic expression, because that's what we're telling people, that that's what the data is being collected for. But if you come up with a broader consent language, your data will be used for, you know, sometimes how you get those emails, I'm like, if you want to unsubscribe, then click the unsubscribe button here. So basically, you consented at some point that yes, we will target you for anything under the sun. You kind of give like a very broad consent. And, and there, are, there aren't really any laws restricting that as long as, you know, your terms of privacy are there. You know, then, I mean, uh, one side of it would be that a lawyer can make an argument, wait a minute, that's like right at the bottom, nobody reads it, like how's that you know, going to make sense? But then a judge would say, well, the, the, the day and age that we live in, you're sort of expected to know that. It's like what a reasonable person would think when they're going. So in the end, it always comes down to who that reasonable person is. If a reasonable person is going online to this website, what is his or her ex reasonable expectation? And if you get more technical, a lot of it, it comes in terms of a lot of softwares that you download and you know the consent just by clicking that you want to make a copy or whatever, or in the back, we will collect data if the software crashes or you know something goes wrong, we will keep collecting data. And, and a lot of time it is, well, if I got to use this software, I have to give consent. So it's like you don't really have a choice, but if you go to a court of law, they'll be like, well, don't use the software then. Nobody's forcing you to use that software. So that's like, don't go to this website. Nobody's forcing you to go to this website, as long as that website has its in, it, in its term of privacy that this will be collected. Yeah, it's something we, we find ourselves talking a, a lot about in the arts and law class, the terms and conditions. Um, some of the lawyers in the class are, uh, as was one, one fairly recently qualified lawyer, who writes these things and she said, yeah, I put in, you know, uh, conditions for the zombie apocalypse and so on, and nobody ever reads it, but, you know, so if you read through these things, then the lawyers are, you know, sometimes having a little fun with it as well. Um, but, I mean, we, we, one of the things we talked about is, you know, is there ways that we can provide, you know, best practice kind of uh, recommendations so people really know what they're getting themselves into. Uh, but again, you know, I think it comes back to this um, amb ambiguous relationship we have with surveillance where, you know, we want to sign up for something. We're going to, you know, 
sell our soul in order to get access to particular apps and products and so on because we want them. Um, so, you know, we make that bargain and we just hope that, you know, nothing bad's going to happen. But sometimes it does. Right. So it's like, who's the reasonable person now? Because exactly. you know, every time you know, I know when I'm on my phone, I use an Android or whatnot. So every time I download an app, there's always you have to give consent to, even though things that are unrelated to the app that we will read your text messages or we will your, your call monitoring, not monitoring, but actually like how much talk time or whatnot. Even though the app is like. I don't know, something completely unrelated, but then it's like, well, as a reasonable person, you are giving consent to this. So yeah, your reasonable person w would change, absolutely. Um, as just recently, there was a, an article in UW Today, about a week ago, about um, some new work that's being done on being able to identify individuals moving in three-dimensional space. And um, it's becoming fairly sophisticated that not only can identify you, but it can just, just track you, but it can actually identify you. And I'm wondering if you comment on that a little bit and how that, this almost seems benign compared to that capability. So well, you, you mean it can identify people from the way they walk or? No. Or just, you just mean face recognition? Yeah. yeah. Similar to what you can do, but yeah. only more sophisticatedly, because they, the three-dimensional, how they're able to track is, mm -hmm. I don't know the tech, uh, the technical aspects of it, Okay. but... Um, yeah, I, I did the... Uh, and it's, can, can, it can identify more than one person moving across the space. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, technology's moving at a rapid rate, um, and, I, you know, we, we are working with what we have access to, but I think there's always the assumption that, you know, there's, there's uh, software out there that would do it better. Um, I, I did a piece recently um, that was uh, shown in Austria over the summer that uses stereo cameras so it can track people in three dimensions, figure out their location as well as profile them. and. Um, Actually, what it did was um, it would collect people in the gallery space and then reconstitute them into groups of people, into crowds of people, all of whom had the same demographic. So it would create like a, a version of the gallery only occupied by men in their 30s or whatever. So it would be able to cut these people out of the image three-dimensionally when they meet particular demographic profiles and then put them back into a panoramic live or well, live seeming video of the of the gallery space so yeah i mean this this stuff's you can do all sorts of things so i have a question about um, the kind of resources that you have being on the umbrella the university of washington and you could legally check all the things for your art installation for individual artists who are in under an umbrella like that and um or don't have resources that are just working on their own. Because I had an idea, like just listening to you about, you know, the the um, Internet of Things that they have out there, where they say all this household things can be turned and surveil you, and you know, you're just popping with ideas. But are there resources out there for individual artists to come and check with the law and find out if what they're actually? Because I have something out there on my website that I put together, you know, a song about you know homeland security and you know, kind of surveillance and all that. But I don't know if the images I'm using, I don't even know if I'm breaking the law. Are there resources of where we could go to check? Yeah, there are actually some really good resources in Washington. So one is called Washington Lawyers for the Arts. That's, a, you know, it's a, again, a nonprofit organization. They do a, they have their monthly clinic where, you know, you get like a half hour of free legal consultations from uh, lawyers that are that practice in the area of uh, artists like uh, art and law. So that's, it's called Washington Lords for the Arts. And then uh, I think there's another one, it's called, uh, 
it's Washington Alliance for, I think, Law and Arts. It's something like that. So, but, so if, you, if you Google that, at least these should come up. But I would personally recommend WLA, so Washington Law for the Arts. They're, they're pretty big, sophisticated. They even do their workshops where some of these issues are addressed. It also, because of individual artists, like you said, you know, if you're using some image, if you're breaking the law, because they do a lot of stuff on copyrights, because there's a lot of, you know, not just privacy, but there's so much of copyrights issue when it comes to art. So I think uh, WLA is a great resource for that. Seattle-based? Yes, yes, they are actually Seattle-based. And I think the, the director, board of directors, he's actually a faculty at UW. And I think he also teaches at the law school, and he's really involved. And I think I figured out he lives in my building, because I think I did see him. So <laughs> he's a very distinct looking person. Yeah, yeah, you can put like some 3D surveillance on me, and then you know, he can like get to him. <laughs> Yeah, the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic at UW. Yeah, like the, the clinic at UW Law, it's Entrepreneurial Law Clinic, so it's open and free to public. You know, anybody can go and then based on what the project is and then they assign you with legal students and a, and a lawyer, supervising lawyer. Hi, thank, thank you for you know this exhibit and your work. Um, I was wondering if you explored, you know, what came to mind for me is sort of the hierarchy involved and who's watching who and who's able to do it because, um, you know, the general people, activists, they're all filmed, you know, and then it's also activists who are taking undercover cameras into factory farm outlets, fur farm, UW, uh, primate lab, non-human primate lab, and all of that. And it's very hard to get into those kinds of buildings too, to get, you know, and those who are in power and elite, Koch brothers, whoever, you know, John Birch Society, it's very hard to get into those places. Um, you know, I'm reminded of one time when someone Slipped up. Oh, it was Romney. Slipped up, and someone caught him on, you know, that that camera. I forget what the thing was. But did you address sort of some of the hierarchy of of uh, surveillance and, and that? I haven't seen the exhibit yet. But. I mean, uh, I think that this comes. It relates to what I was saying before with the Occupy movement and. Um, you know, obviously there are hierarchies in surveillance, as the Snowden revelations really showed us you know uh, it's frustrating in some ways that artists can only you know approach sort of the tip of the iceberg it's important i think that we we can be able to get access to to the to data on the scale that we are experiencing it in everyday life in order to really try and i don't know subvert it irritate it whatever and so you know working on a project where you think, oh, if only Google kind of exposed all this data, freed everything up so we could really use it and say something with that. But they just give you enough to make it seem like they are being, uh, you know, open when they're really not. Um, but, I, you know, I do think it's important. I, I was in Hong Kong recently for an exhibition, and again, uh, you know, the Occupy protests were happening there. And I was talking to some uh, people, the, the professors at uh, Hong Kong City University, and most of their students were taking part in these uh, protests. And they, you know, they, they were really concerned for their students. They said, well, uh, I'm really worried that the Chinese government is going to see them posting things on Facebook and they're going to get in trouble. And I said, well, you know, in, in some ways that's their security, that they are making themselves visible, people are aware of what's happening. And if something was to happen to them, um, maybe it would be harder, at least, for that to happen because they have this kind of global um, awareness of who they are and what they're doing. And I'm reminded of uh, you know, Tiananmen Square um, and the fact that the following day in Tiananmen Square, there were no bullet holes anywhere. Uh, so in some ways, like the hierarchy of uh, surveillance, the visibility that it provides people with, 
becomes a strategic tool of sorts. And so if we're going to you know, watch the watches, then I think we have to use their own tools against them to some extent. Uh, there's a Peter Singer article um, I, I read recently which you know, uh, points out that things like WikiLeaks are only possible because the infrastructure is there in order to share that information. So the very thing that you know, it's critiquing, that it's leaking, it relies on that same infrastructure in order to share it. And so I think there are strategies for sure that artists and you know, other uh, empowered individuals can, um, can deploy, uh, which don't require us to kind of remove ourselves entirely from those systems. I, I think in, in many ways uh, that's a disadvantage to kind of say, well, we're going to do something completely different. I think one of the best critical positions to assume is inside that system. You know. Um, <laughs> So my question is for the artist, um, but also about the call, the original call for proposals. Um, I think it's fascinating that what evolved out of the problem that you posed and asked the artist the solution for is essentially an invasion of privacy in and of itself to what was originally an architectural problem, um, a problem of physical space. And I was just wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about how you arrived at this being the solution to what I would think of the solution being as maybe a door or a sign or something <laughs> that was a little bit more about the building and less about the people. That's a great question. Uh, interestingly, we, we, real, we didn't know what we wanted. We knew what the desired outcome was. The desired outcome was that we would engage students going by, passers-by. And we would engage them in such a way that um, it would it would be a, 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 an engagement that they would think about, that they might have to make a choice in relationship to that engagement, come in, not come in, wonder about the place, tell others about it, decide it's not for them. Uh, yes, we could have dealt with it. We th originally, we thought neon graphics. There are all kinds of ways that you can draw attention to yourself. But what is aligned with our mission and what's true to what we do is that when we have problems, we ask artists to solve them. Uh, and that's where the idea, the, the idea for a commission came from. What came to us, the range of offerings out of 91 submissions, wasn't as far, far flung as we thought it might be which was a surprise because we had a lot of people, uh, we, we posted, uh, we had a couple of advisor, advisors in the field helping us understand what are the um, websites and the zines and where we should post to get the broadest exposure for the call for entries. And, and I think we had hoped to get more entries that would have a kind of a tooth and a rigor to them, even though that's not what we thought we wanted because we didn't know what we wanted from the get-go. Uh, and that's where it helped us realize that um, really maybe it, it's not a question of visibility in an architectural question. That's where we started. But we really are, want to be asking these larger questions about something these artists brought forward to us. And I, I guess it reminds me a little bit about the kind of work that we do with artists. Artists rarely know from the outset exactly what it is they're going to do with a project. And, and we have the pleasure and the privilege of watching that process when we, when we support them uh, and learning alongside and, and uh, having that privileged access truly to the creative process. And so that's, that's what this was like as well. And I'm, I'm sorry that Juan isn't here to be with us today because he is a part of the duo, the team. Uh, and I might just take this moment, if I've answered your question, I might take this moment just to ask James if he would talk about that collaboration for a moment and then we'll get back to the questions. Yeah, um, so Juan is uh, he's the chair of DX Arts. Um, so, uh, I've been in DXS for over 10 years now, uh, so we've, we've worked together for a long time, and we've you know worked, collaborate, collaborated on projects uh, in terms of technology and so on previously, but this is the first kind of formal uh, collaboration we've been involved with. 
uh, together uh, as artists. Uh, one is um, his background is in composition, sound, and um, I guess once we started hearing about the fact that the Henry was going to have a facade project, it seemed to be something that they were open to being a new media project. Um, since you know, that's we walk past the Henry all the time. Uh, we were familiar with the kind of dynamic of the space. Um, it was something that we were interested in working together on. Uh, Juan had been developing some uh, ultrasound um, sort of speaker systems which were directional. So he could program them to track people without having to actually move the uh, ultrasound arrays. So those are what you see, those kind of strange looking uh, things that are like sensors or whatever um, on the pillars in, the, in front of the piece. Um, and, you know, as I've been saying, I've been working with surveillance um, installations for a while. So it seemed like a, an interesting place to, to collaborate. Um, and I think, I think, you know, we've both really uh, learned a lot from the experience uh, institutionally. I think it helped a lot that we were already here, you know. There's been a lot of meetings. Um, so, um, yeah, we, you know, it, it's also become something really useful for, for DX Arts. I mentioned the law school program, uh, law school class for teaching, and we've um, had our own students very much engaged in surveillance. We've taught surveillance art classes and so on. So it's really been a, a big, you know, um, you know, game changer of sorts for, for both of us and for the program in general. This probably applies to art projects too, I would think, but the uh, Google Glass incident in San Francisco. How is it, I haven't followed that, but how has that played out? How does that affect future art projects, things like that? I don't know. What, what I'm referring to is that Google Glass, where somebody walked into a bar, I think it was a bar, and they're being recorded, they're being photographed um, without their consent. And I would think that's gonna play a very important part in all this stuff eventually. Well, I, I, as I understand it, Google has discontinued Google Glass now, right? Is that maybe Completely? Possible? Yeah, they, they're shutting down that project. Oh. I guess because there are a lot of privacy issues with that because yes, you can record people in private places, but then there was a Seattle incident too, which was, I think, on at least some of the local papers where there's a, I believe it's, a, there's a diner on Capitol Hill, uh, Lost Lake, and there was the individual who went with his Google glasses, and you know, it's easy to tell, you know, because they're very weird looking, you know, and there's a big thing here. And so I think the owner of, or the actual, the, one of the servers told that person to take it off because you know, it's you can say okay, it's a pub, it's not really a public place. It's a private establishment. There's an owner, and they have every right to you know stop that. And that person didn't really want to, so it make a big deal about it, and they kicked that person out. And then I think there was that bar, and there was another one that actually posted, "We don't allow you to get in here with Google glasses on." So because there is a huge privacy issue because you are recording people without letting them know and you're giving it to Google. Yeah, and then you know and Google I'm sure is collecting data with whatever. But I think now, like James said, they've they've shut down that project. So basically there's it may come down in a different iteration, you know, down the line, but right yeah, now so. yeah, but right now I the the project is they're they're shutting down that project. I sort of have a question because and I don't know if you can even based on confidentiality issues. So you mentioned that when it came to selecting this project, it came between James and Juan and then another team. Mm -hmm. Can you tell what was their project or what was their proposal? Um, the, actually, no. Okay, that's what I thought, because yeah, you, know, you may tell have. I who they are. Okay. And, and like, I will I'll repeat who they are for those of you who may have come in a little bit late. Ed Perver, a New York-based artist, um, his practice includes participatory and interactive site-specific installations. Uh, and then Natalie Gat Gatteno and Jason Kelly Johnson designed principles of Future Cities Labs. 
And when you submit a proposal for a competition, it's it's not our right to right, share right. what it thought. is. Yeah. It's their creative effort. Um, so no, I get okay. it. Okay, yeah, that. that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was really interested in the idea of self-surveillance that you brought up, um, especially with Facebook and stuff. Um, I'm a millennial, I'm on all of those things all the time. Um, and I guess one of the things that I wondered about was if you think that this type of, how you think this type of social self-surveillance uh, has changed how we are able to access ourselves um, and our self-identity. Because um, it seems like in the past, it's like before you had computers and the internet, you might be able to access that if you had created something in a physical space or you looked at a mirror, like maybe you wrote a book and you would be like, this is how it was received. People are telling me how it went over with them or I'm looking at myself in a mirror. Whereas now we have kind of direct access to all of our own thoughts coming up, being perceived by other people. Um, do you think that that's fracturing for the self? Do you think that that's unifying for selves? Do you think it, I don't know, yeah, about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we were just talking earlier, Mudit said he just signed up for the Sanctum app on Facebook, and when you do that, it gives you, I think, your most recent 100 status posts you've made um, instantly. And, um, you know, I think that was, that was revealing. You know, he's like, oh, here I am, you know, what a... I can't believe I said that or whatever. I know, I told him, like, did I say that? Because, you know, it was there and Facebook pulled it up from a yeah. year before. And I was like, oh, I don't believe I said that. But, of course, I did because I posted it on Facebook. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, guess, I guess to a large extent, um, we, we are massively affected in terms of how we understand our identity, how we understand our, our kind of history and our connectivity with other people from this. Um, I think it's a it's an issue, you know. As a as a professor, um, students not really needing to know things in the same kind of way. They just can look it up, right? Uh, so there's this kind of pancake effect where people know a little bit about a lot of things, but they don't know anything in much depth. So maybe there's 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 that kind of element. But you know, I, I am interested, uh, as I said before, in in this kind of dynamic between um, voyeurism and exhibitionism that seems to have emerged from uh, social media as a kind of paradigm. Um, and maybe, you know, we see some instances where that kind of translates into the real world. But I also think it's a really positive thing in that um, it provides maybe some, um, I don't know, it's like a training camp of sorts for how to deal with privacy, how to control your identity. Um, because increasingly it seems, especially in light of the uh, Snowden revelations, that those are, those are skills and tools we need to have available um, to navigate our way through the world nowadays. Um, so yeah, of course, it has, it has a massive effect on identity, narrative as well, how we understand stories, how we connect ideas together. Um, and I guess that all comes back to the data body idea as well. My question has to do with the selection of uh, demographic criteria that you selected, which was gender and age. And if you entertained any other sort of profiling uh, categories and why gender and age in the context of this project. Um, well, the simple reason for using gender and age is because that's what Facebook does. Um, so the algorithm is technically capable of also profiling race, um, for instance, and the piece I mentioned um, that I did over the summer where it organized people into groups um, used race as well. Um, but what we were looking for is some uh, way of conflating uh, Facebook data with uh, real world kind of public space. And so when you sign up for Facebook, you're asked for your age, your gender. Um, beyond that, there's not really demographic information that um, is exposed, at least by by the Facebook uh, API, by the Facebook kind of programming language. So that's what we that's what we went with. That 
the system's understanding is kind of limited to what social media can provide. So in other words, the algorithm, what we're seeing is the way the algorithm sees us. Um, and you know, obviously I think we could say because of this kind of metadata versus content uh, dialogue that obviously Facebook has a lot more demographic information about us than, than that. I mean, even if you're lying about your age or your gender or whatever, then you, you know, that, that's not really what's important to Facebook. You know, it, it can figure out who you are in much more complex uh, ways than that. Um, but that's what drove that decision. So you've spoken a lot to kind of the legal barriers, um, but what about the technology itself? So apart from the kind of legality of it, um, what was the process like to create all of these algorithms and kind of uh, the technology to do facial recognition and then kind of pull out that data from the internet? Um, did you build this all yourself? Um, was it kind of based on a foundation of knowledge that's readily accessible, um, so just kind of ignoring legal stuff. Okay, um, yeah, uh, the, there was a, a large number of people who worked on Sanctum, um, and uh, you know, that ranges from people, students who helped us develop the original um, uh, proposal, um, uh, and you know, uh, we made a video simulation of the project for the uh, for the original panel. Um, uh, Ava over there um, developed the Facebook application um, using um, the Facebook API, which is readily available uh, if you know how to to use that kind of thing. The part I work for was basically the API, the Facebook app and the website through which you collect, basically sign up, and also it's based on basically information about the project. So it's basically database. Yeah. Database, based application. But the, you know, the, um, the face recognition or face profiling stuff goes back to some of my earlier work. And, and in some ways, you know, Sanctum uh, brings together a few different earlier projects. So I have uh, worked with face profiling since about like 2008 or nine, and that came out of a collaboration with um, York University in the UK. And there's a professor there who's developing this, these algorithms. And so I was introduced to him and um, we started, you know, throwing some ideas around and, and uh, developed a kind of version of the software that could be used uh, in my projects. So I've been working, that, working with that for a while. And it was, it was recently uh, commercialized by a company in San Francisco who kind of expanded the database of faces that were in it so it became more accurate. And so we worked with those guys as well. Um, the Facebook side of things I, I developed uh, 2010, um, a Facebook application. I think it's maybe one of the first kind of Facebook apps that was an art project um, back then that would um, take people's Facebooks, Facebook statuses and use it to generate essentially film scripts or narratives that then became associated with portraits of people um, and YouTube video clips that corresponded to keywords in the text. So there was these, these kind of uh, short videos that would get generated from Facebook. Uh, so a lot of the underlying technology on the Facebook side was developed then. Um, we worked with this guy from uh, University of Southern California who had been developing ways of um, summarizing blog postings, like millions of lines of blog postings into short narratives. So I worked with him to um, convert this f to be used with Facebook status posts. So when we have Facebook status posts available through the application, the algorithm evaluates how story-like they are. So if you just say, like, hi, it doesn't, doesn't come through to the system. But if you have something where, say, you know, I woke up and walked the dog, it says, OK, yeah, that's story-like. And then we'll put that into the database. and then. Add, combine it with some other ones which maybe thematically or grammatically cohere with that and you end up with a story 
So it sort of brings all those different things together. And then there was a lot of software development that was done uh, by people like James Hughes at DX Arts, um, which was used to control the way that the screens uh, worked, how the video is distributed across all those systems. I think there's about like nine computers behind the scenes hidden away somewhere in a Henry that are controlling all these different uh, processes. And then computer vision. At DX Arts, we have a computer vision uh, postdoc called Yi Ding, who uh, uh, designed many of the um, detection algorithms and optimized the face recognition stuff as well. So you're creating these technologies for artistic purposes, but you're also kind of pushing the boundaries of what's possible with surveillance. And so when you're creating them, um, do you think about how they're going to be used later? You said some of your earlier technologies have been commercialized. So does that bother you with that? If you kind of came across something really kind of um, new and innovative that could be used kind of dangerously, would that prevent you from kind of exploring the artistic side of it um, or not? Um, well, I mean, the technology that was commercialized was developed by York University, and, you know, so it's, it's not my intellectual property. I, I don't take responsibility for what they do with it. They made two apps, one which tell you how good looking you are and one which tells you how old you are. So, you know, that's up to them. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the kind of moral or ethical uh, relationship to the code and to these systems, you know, I think um, I think I think it's inter you know these projects always bring up those questions. Um, you know, moral dilemmas. If you have some video that you've shot and is in, in part of an installation and it shows, I think one one example was uh, what if it shows uh, a woman who's meeting her lover and her husband who has a heart condition sees a video and has a heart attack. You know, what would you do? Kind of thing. And you know, I think I think that's that's just. I don't think you should you you can skirt around that and avoid making the work for those kind of reasons. Intellectual property wise, um, you know, in terms of retaining control and uh, how these things are use, used, again comes back to the good relationship we have with the law school and questions of intellectual property and how to protect maybe the artistic knowledge that's here. I think also that. You know, these projects like this are, are combinations of like so many different bits of software, different bits of intellectual property, that it makes it very difficult to, A, for anybody else to put it together, and B, for it to be uh, maintained, you know. Um, so at one point, when we were talking with the Henry, they said, well, we'd like to acquire this project. And we said, well, how would you do that, you know? Um, do you even know what's involved? We, maybe we can't even give it to you because we don't own half of it, you know? So these things are about mixing together different algorithms to generate something new, and I don't know. I'm not sure how, how people would uh, misuse them, but hopefully not. And with that, we're at noon. Um, may I invite you for a couple of things? There are two videos on our YouTube uh, Henry site about Sanctum. One is just a short video about it, and one is an interview with both Juan and James. Uh, we also have a terrific afternoon planned. Presentations by our, our artists Adam Harvey and Holly Herndon. You, uh, you saw professor and lawyer Sean O'Connor will be here. So I invite you to come back at 1.30. During the lunch break, Please, your admission to this symposium also gives you free admission to the Henry. Uh, we have an exhibition on by the artist Ann Hamilton that occupies all of our space, so please feel free to view that. And hopefully we'll see you back here at 1.30. Thank you.